Peninsula a week and a half ago. I contacted Sister Terry and said, we need a flyer, we need a poster for the toy giveaway. And we didn't have any toys yet. We just, I had one person say, I'm gonna get some, and God said, I'm gonna do the rest. I said, so let's go ahead and put it out there. And surely, uh, within the next two days, we started getting phone calls from people. I'm bringing a box load of toys. I'm bringing this many toys. I'm bringing this many toys. And then uh, Brother Walker Beverly from Advancing Steps, he has a nonprofit here in the region. He says, I'm bringing toys. And before you know it, we had, I think, six tables full of toys. Amen. 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 And if you had seen the line, when I came out of the office, the line started at the front gate right here and wrapped to the other side of the building behind me. And just to see the smiles on the faces and the kids that were so joyful. And I think this was the most special year of all because of what everybody's gone through. And I could just see how many of those parents out there didn't know how they were going to do Christmas this year. Because many have been out of work for six months because of the shutdowns. And on top of that, we had, uh, it was at least 700 stuffed animals. And it was a lot of stuffed animals, right? And uh, we, if anybody wants stuffed animals, we can get, we can get I think, 1,500 more. If y'all want some, let me know. <laughs> but we had stuffed animals below. We had a whole zoo out there yesterday of stuffed animals. But it was just a blessing to see everybody so excited and so happy. And so Sister Faye and Sister Terry and Evangelist Charlotte and, and, and Pastor and, and, and who else had their hands to the plow yesterday? I don't want to miss anybody. Uh, Brother Reggie and Elder Shaylin. And if, I, if I miss anybody, please forgive me, but I'm just overjoyed by what I saw yesterday. Um, it, was, it, it ran smoothly. It was socially distanced outside and all that kind of good stuff. But people were blessed. So thank you all, Word of Life, and thank you all who were serving yesterday. Most importantly, thank God for what we were able to do. Amen. Uh, our hospitality team, they're going to be feeding uh, this week a Christmas dinner, correct, Mother Mary? A Christmas dinner. For Thanksgiving, they serve nearly 300 people, right? Wow. So we're on there? Not quite. Not quite. I'm, 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 I'm thinking between the food boxes and the meals or something. Yeah, okay, so so for Christmas, you can expect them to have quite a bit quite a bit of hungry people there. Let's keep them in prayer, and if you have a minute to go down and volunteer, or maybe go down just to meet some cool people, it's on well, Tuesday, right? Tuesday from 3 to 5, at, over at Estrella. But Mother Mary is sitting next to the biggest Christmas gift I've seen in a long time. Uh, <laughs> Last week, her daughter-in-law was here, and I said, all the way from Hawaii, Mother Mary's daughter-in-law is here. And I said, her husband, Mother Mary's son, can't be here. He was on, he's on duty. But I saw a Facebook video where he surprised her at home the other night. And Brother Tyler is here with us today. God bless you, man. Good to see you. That is, that is hope. I call him hope. He's just, he, one day I saw him jogging down the street. His thighs are bigger than my shoulders. I said, that don't make no sense. So, man. Mary, Merry Christmas to you. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Uh, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. This Wednesday, um, our old sister Lisa Walter is having surgery. Um, if you don't remember who she is, she's the lady that sits in a wheelchair normally over on this side. She hasn't been here since the pandemic started because of her health, but I got a text this morning. She's having surgery Wednesday, so let's keep her in prayer. Let's go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. When we get there, we're going to chapter 1. We're going to go down to verse, verse 10, 9, 9 or 10, 9 or 10. You don't have to say anything to your neighbor. Just repeat after me. When you remember who you are, when you never forget who you were, you can't help but praise God. think back to who I used to be and the things that I used to do and I tell stories and Elder Franklin and I have been talking about some old memories we were talking about some old college memories and I told him I can't believe that A I'm not in jail, dead, something to something and I can't believe that he actually chose me to preach his gospel with all the stuff that I did and so when I think about it or I remember who I am and I think about who I was I can't do nothing but thank God for that Anybody have that testimony where I just look back over my life and I said, thank you, Jesus. 
I may not be where I want to be, but I'm so glad I'm not who I used to be. Anybody have that testimony right there? Looking back over photo albums and memories and thoughts, and I'm just sitting there realizing how good God has been just to me alone. And I know that if he's been good to me, he's been good to some of y'all. And I just believe that if we had took time to have a testimony service, there'd be everybody in here testifying to the fact that God did something miraculous just to change your life. And so I want to read this passage of scripture from Ephesians chapter 2. It says, uh, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. Let's skip down to verse uh, 4. But God so rich in his mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Yeah. It's only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised to us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. If I could pause right there, he said he raised us up and he set us in the heavenly realms. Do you know where you're supposed to sit? Isn't that something? Right? He said he placed us in heavenly realms. Will you know where your seat is? Will you know where your seat is? Will you know where your seat is? You won't be trapped up with a bunch of foolishness. Woo! Verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed that you cannot take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Listen, Paul was writing this church to the church in Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. And this is one of Paul's few letters where he wasn't writing to correct anybody or put anybody in their place or teach against false doctrine. He was really writing to encourage this church. And today, when I, when I said, when you remember who you are, you think where you came from, you can't do anything but thank God. This is to encourage us because we have been beaten up too much this year. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to even stand here in front. I, I am worried about my colleagues that are pastoring and that are leading ministries and their mental health because this, this vocation has been attacked all year long. Either you don't open up or you do open up. Either you wear a mask or you don't wear a mask. If you wear a mask, you're not, you don't have faith. And if you do, you have, we've, been, we've been attacked all year long. Where is the pastor? How come the pastor ain't called to check on me? And ain't nobody called to check on the pastor. We're all dealing with the pandemic together. And I can tell you, we've been beat up all all year long. But I know it's not just the pastors. Some of you have been beat up all year long. And God said, no, I want to encourage the people to know that although you've been beat up, you're still favored by me. Although you've been beat up, you're still sitting in heavenly places with me. Although you've been beat up, you still have my grace on your life. As a matter of fact, you've been beat up, but you've survived it because of the hand of me that is on your life. And so remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. Now, now I know in a season like we're in, I always say to think back over the things that God has done for you. And then you can start to get glory because he start to give him glory because of things that he brought you out of. Yes, sir. And so usually when you say something like that, people think of sickness. Oh, I remember when I was sick and God touched my body. Some of us know COVID survivors and some of us have been exposed to COVID and get, didn't get touched with it. And you think back and you say, thank you, Jesus. It could have been me. And then you think back on poverty. You think about the times where you didn't have enough money to pay rent and the car note to put gas in the car and food on the table. But you never went hungry. You were always able to drive and you never got evicted. You start to praise God about that. And then you think about your mental health, how all the times just this year alone where you wanted to quit and you figured nobody would miss me if I wasn't here and you thought about throwing in the towel because depression had just wrapped your mind and you didn't want to move you didn't want to pray some you didn't want a happy birthday you didn't want any you didn't want no hug you didn't want a physical contact you just wanted to be right in the midst of where you were in that dark place and then God touched you and the next morning you got up and you saw that the sun was shining and the birds were chirping and suddenly your problems didn't seem that big and then you start thinking about the emotional things how this year you got to you got to find out truly that who you thought were your friends really weren't your friends because this is what I've come to find out. And the pandemic separated us from a lot of people who we thought really had our back. The pandemic separated us from a lot of people who we really thought had our best interests at heart. And then you start to realize that that hurt because I poured into you, I covered you, I loved you, and you allowed COVID to separate us. You start thinking about that stuff and you say, but God, when they walked away from me, God said, I got you. When they refused to answer the call, God said, I got you. When they didn't want to come around anymore, God said, I got you. When they started talking about you, God said, I got you. When the people you covered tried to uncover you, God said, I got you. Anybody glad for the hand of God on their life right now? But, but, but it goes beyond that. 
because God said those four things are good. I did deliver you from that. He says, but I don't want you to get short-sighted and remember that I delivered you from sin. We get so saved that we forget that we used to be in sin. We get so holy and have so many titles and degrees behind our name and we forget that God delivered us from something. Oh, boy. Oh, I'm afraid we might have to start the car because I'm going to run out here in a minute. But we, we get so highfalutin that we forget that God delivered us out of something. Yes, you, 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 and me, we were all a wretch undone. God found us in some stuff we had no business doing. Okay, watch this, watch this, watch this. Get to the text. Paul said this. He says, Paul, Paul says in, 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 uh, in uh, verse 2, uh, verse 3, all of us used to live that way, following passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. Remember, Paul said in Romans 6, 26 and 23, the wages of sin is what? Yes, God healed my body. Yes, God touched my mind. Yes, God comforted me when people walked away from me. Yes, God touched my mind when I was depressed. But more importantly than all of that, he saved me from dying in sin. Yeah. Ooh, that's another thing. See, this is the problem. See, we've, we've minimized that miracle by itself because we want to praise God for the new car. We want to praise God for the new boo. We want to praise God for the increase in work. But how, when was the last time you just stopped and gave God a praise simply because he saved your soul from hell? How soon we forget. Paul said to Corinthians, it's 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, he says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Yes. Don't fool yourself. Those who indulge in sexual sin, worship idols, commit adultery, male prostitutes, practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, abusive, cheap people. He said these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. But verse 11, he says, before you get high for and want to cast stones at people, some of you were once like that. He's talking to the church folks in Corinthians. He said, yes, I know you want to preach that everybody is going to hell that ain't living right. But while you're preaching that, don't forget, some of you used to be that same way. Yes, <laughs> and so we get so highfalutin because we've been delivered for two, three, four, five, six years. We forget that we used to be that way as well. But when you really wrap your mind around the fact that he saved your soul, you really don't have any room to judge anybody. When you really wrap your mind around the fact that he saved your soul for the mess that you in, you are in. You really have no room to look down on anybody for the mess that they're in. As a matter of fact, if you think back, and I used to watch Batman. <clears throat> anybody watch Batman growing up? And y'all remember the quicksand. The quicksand, right? They're sinking in quicksand. And Robin, Robin says, uh, Holy bad guy from Bethlehem, Batman. How are we going to get out of this? And they're sinking in the sand. And we're laughing, but if you think back to what God rescued you from, whatever the lifestyle was, whatever the choices you were making were, you were literally sinking in quicksand. And it wasn't but the grace of God that reached down and picked you up and pulled you out of that thing. When you, and this is why you always have to remember who you were. Because if you remember who you were and you celebrate where he brought you from, you won't get highfalutin and start looking down at people because they're in the same mess that you were in. Do you not realize that the reason people won't come to church is because they're afraid that we're going to look down on them? <laughs> Why in the world do I come to church smelling like weed and all they're going to do is tell me I don't belong? Man. And usually the person who's telling you you don't belong was just smelling like weed two weeks ago. <laughs> Somebody say, how soon do we forget? <laughs> we, we, we go, we, we, it's okay, you can be mad. We're going to celebrate it. We're just going to worry about it. But... <laughs> But we have to understand that Paul said, he goes on to say that we were all working for Satan. We were all, y'all don't believe, okay. But look, at, look at Ephesians 2, look at Ephesians 2. Look at verse uh, 2. It says, the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world, he is the, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. This is for the people that say God knows my heart. I want to serve the Lord, but he knows my heart. 
Paul said that those that refuse to obey God, their heart is full of the devil. Y'all see it for yourself? Okay. But then, he says, before you get high-minded, verse 3, all of us used to live that way. So why is it in the church, the one place where everybody should be understanding that's right. of a person that's struggling to overcome something, right. why is it that the church is the most judgmental place of all? Amen. I got to the point where I was almost afraid, I'm not talking about here, I'm talking about other churches I was a part of, got to the point where I was almost afraid to invite somebody to church. Because here it is, I'm trying to welcome them in and introduce them to a savior who will meet them right where they are, touch their soul right where they are, and allow the Holy Spirit to wash them with the, with the water of the word. But I was afraid to because I just felt like before they could get the word, they had some eyes staring at them. Before they could get the word, they had somebody talking about them. And this is why I used to say when we first put at this church, if sister so-and-so walk in here and her skirt is too short, the first thing you should do should, should not be go put a sheet on her. How about you ask her how she's doing? How about you go on the right where she is? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Don't worry about my voice, it'll be fine. I want us to really recognize the fact that God is saying in this season, if we're going to really celebrate Jesus, let's celebrate what he really did for us. Not just the things that we celebrate all year long. Celebrate the fact that he saved our souls so we can be a blessing to others. I just don't remember the last time I heard somebody say, Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Because I was about to die in sin and you saved me. Yes, sir. Yes. Think about it. When was the last time you said it? Yes, sir. I've heard, thank you, Jesus. I got to pray for the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. He touched my body. Thank you, Jesus. I got the increase at work. Thank you, Jesus. I beat the DUI case. Thank you, Jesus. I, I, didn't, get, I, didn't, I didn't go to jail. Thank you, Jesus. But what was the last time you yourself said, thank you, Jesus, for coming so I wouldn't die in the sin that I was in? Paul said, so remember, remember who you were and what he did. But then Paul also says, remember how much he loved you. Look at verse 4, Ephesians chapter 2. He says, for God is so rich in his mercy, he loved us so much that even when we were dead because of our sins, he gave his life and raised Christ from the dead. Now, another check this He said, God loved us so much that even though we were dead, he sent Christ. Yeah. You know how hard it is to give somebody a gift that you know ain't going to do right in the first place? Let your child who gets straight D's every year and every semester come to you and say, I want a car. I can sense the parent belts coming up right now. <laughs> Let the person who you know is struck out on crack come to you and ask for $5 to pay their rent. You're going to look at them like, no, because I know what you're going to do. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you this gift, but I know you're not going to do right with it. God loved us so much that even when we weren't doing right, he still gave us a gift. You don't go okay, because they don't believe me. Let me read it a little bit further. Let's go to Romans 5. Let's go to Romans 5. <clears throat> Where is Romans 5 and 8. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. We had made up our minds that we wanted to be delivered from where we were in, but he sent Christ anyway. Could you imagine how much you have to love somebody to give them a gift that you know they're not going to appreciate or really accept at that time. Y'all thinking yet? Paul goes on to tell us that to the church people, that yeah, he saved us, but we don't deserve it. I think in the church we've gotten so entitled to where we think that we have a market or a corner on God's grace. So much so that we have the audacity to get mad when God blesses somebody who's not a part of the church. Amen. The scripture says that he reigns on the just and the unjust alike. Does not say that? And so what happens is we have the nerve and the audacity to get upset when God blesses people that we just don't like. Y'all see that? 
Somebody do you wrong and you can't stand to see them. And it's like, God, why are you blessing them and you did me wrong? And God is saying, wait, you don't have a monopoly on my grace. I give grace out however. You don't deserve it either. Okay, y'all, y'all just so deep. Is it because it's Christmas week, y'all that deep? Y'all too deep for me. Because I can be honest with you, there have been times when people have done me wrong and I said, God, get them. <clears throat> get them, Jesus. Woo, make them feel all the pain. Woo, touch them where they're right now because they never should have messed with me. Y'all and then the next week, I see them skate. And you want to go to God and you say, God, she don't deserve your favor because of what she did to me. And if you take time to stay at the altar to hear him speak, he'll say, you don't deserve my favor because of what you did to me. I told Mr. Spirit yesterday, I said, I'm glad y'all see me Christmas songs because I'm not a theme preacher. Just because it's Christmas don't mean I'm preaching Jesus in the manger. I, just, I, just want, I gotta go with what the Lord tells me to do. <clears throat> and in spite of the fact that we're celebrating his birth this week nationally and worldwide, we do also have to prepare for the fact that he's sending a new generation into the church as soon as COVID ends. Yes, sir. And how is it that we can pray for increase and not know how to handle increase? There's a story in the Bible when they went fishing. And the Bible says that they, they were done fishing and Jesus said, cast your nets to the other side. And since they put their nets to the other side and they got so much fish that their nets begin to break. What that teaches is one, that God will send you increase. But two, if you're not ready to handle the increase, you'll lose it all in your nets. So how in the world can we praise God for new souls coming to the church when COVID ends when we don't know how to act right now? So Bishop, okay, I get it. So none of us deserved it. But what separates us who claim to be in Christ from the world then, if none of us deserve it? If we can't earn it. Look at Galatians 5.24. Paul says this, those who belong to Christ Jesus have railed their passions, nailed their passions and desires and their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Paul said, Galatians 5 and 24, because you're in Christ, you've nailed those desires. And those habits to the cross. That's right. Not saying that you won't have a struggle, because we all have struggles. Right. I had an attitude problem this morning. We all have struggles. Okay, three of us got struggles. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> three of us got struggles, and the rest of us are on our way up the King's Highway. I'm not going to that. News for you in 2021. If you're looking for the perfect church with the perfect leaders, you got to get up out of here. Amen. Matter of fact, I'll tell you now if you're looking for the perfect church of perfect leaders, you need to run far away from this place. I mean, don't even look back, Lot's wife. Just keep going down the street, like wherever you got to go. Don't look back. But I like the music. Get out of here. That's what you're looking for. I'm just tell me, I'm warning you now. Okay, I'm warning you now. And if you yourself are perfect, get out of here. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He says that we've nailed our passions and desires of our sinful nature to the cross. What that means is, because I'm in Christ, I no longer desire to do the things that I used to do. That does not mean that I'm not tempted to do them. Can we, can we talk? Can we, can we just be here, yeah, right? That does not mean that I'm tempted to do them. And I'll just pick on something that's small. Because I'm in Christ, I no longer make it a habit to cuss everybody out. That does not mean I'm not tempted to do so. My mouth let you know. I was proficient and efficient in cussing you out. After I got to Christ, I nailed my desire to belittle you with my words to the cross. 
But that does not mean that I'm still not tempted to do so. Because if we're honest with ourselves, there could be some Sundays where you in church and somebody do something wrong and you walk away. Okay, I'm going to show you. <clears throat> you ever been minding your business and you get a text message that just ruins your day? Now, your desire to cuss them out is nailed to the cross. But you're still tempted to do it. And if you're anything like me, are you so and so? And I wish you would <laughs> send one more text and we go. The difference between us and those that don't believe, before we hit send, chances are the Holy Spirit is telling us to believe that. Yeah. Have you ever typed out a three paragraph response and the Holy Ghost said delete that real quick? Right? Okay, right, right. Because my sinful nature is nailed to the cross, the Holy Ghost will not let me go up like that now. I can choose in my flesh to override the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is a gentleman. He's not going to force me to do anything. But Galatians 5 says that my flesh wars against the Spirit. So when the Spirit is telling you not to cuss them out, your flesh ain't going to give it to them. That's what they want. Church is going to tell you to slap your neighbor. Go outside, touch the Mercedes Benz, and dance around until you get it. Let me know. I will tell you. I'll direct you. I promise you I'll direct you. If you, if you want to go to a church that's going to tell you everything is good and everything because you got Jesus, there'll be no struggles. I'll go. Let me know. I will direct you there. But all we can do is tell you the truth here. That's not it. So I thank the Lord for Jesus this yes. holiday season. One, because I remember who I used to be. Yes. Two, because I've recognized because of him, I no longer have to go back to where I used to be. Right. Uh, if that's something, I don't have to go back. It is something that when Jesus, he says goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Which means that when I turn around and try to go back to my past, I have to go through goodness and mercy. Yes, sir. Ain't that something? I should be excited about that. Here, 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 here's, here's the third thing. He says, now I want you to understand before you get cocky. Yes, you're not who you used to be. Two, you have power because of Jesus to keep you not from going back to what you used to do. But now three, I need you to understand. You didn't earn this and there's nothing that you did to, give, to bring this upon you. Because whatever happens in, in America, especially in Pentecostal churches with denominations, we seem to think that they more saved than them, and they more saved than them, and they more saved than them. Nobody is more saved than anybody. I wear a gold chain and I have an office of bishop, but I'm not more saved than you. So that messes up people's theology. It does, because when I tell you I'm not more saved than you, that means, well, then I can't go. No, you can't come to me. I'm not the advocate for you. Jesus Christ is the advocate for you. I'm not more saved than you are. We're all saved into the household of faith. And so now he says, you didn't earn this. Now, this is what I want to get to, and I'm, I'm, we're out of here. I, we're not, we didn't earn this. And why, why is this so important? Because for whatever reason, we think we got lifetime achievement uh, uh, honors in the kingdom. I've been saved 37 years. Don't you see the collar around my neck? I speak in several unknown tongues. I interpret, I got all the gifts. I lay hands on myself and I fall out. Just all my stuff just fall out. That's what I do. I got it all. I'm just super saved, super holy. And what we've done is we've taken our titles, we've taken the miracles that God has performed through our hands, and we position ourselves to be more holy than anybody else. But God has said, do you not know that I can make a donkey talk? Do you not know that I can make a bush give a sign or something? Do you not know that I can use a stick to part the Red Sea? Do you not know that I can use a stone to slay a giant? What makes you think that you are all that different than anybody else? But this is another denominational issue that we have in, in, in all, to all my friends from different denominations that don't agree with what I'm about to say. I love you with the love of the Lord, right? Y'all with me? Okay, good, okay. 
I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to read it first. God saved you, Ephesians 2, verse 8. God saved you by his grace when you believe, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. You can't earn your way into salvation. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe with thy heart, thou shalt what? Be saved. It's as simple as that. Confess and believe. Some will tell you that in order to be saved, you've got to be baptized. Ooh. Some will say you're not saved until you go into the water. Rewind. Ephesians 2, verse 9. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. Some will tell you that you're not saved unless you give to the poor. Rewind. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. Some will tell you that you're not saved unless you, unless you tithe and give offerings. Salvation is not a reward for the good thing. Are y'all with me? Yes. You can't earn your way into heaven. Now, concerning baptism, I tell people, I don't get baptized to get saved. I get baptized because I am saved. I don't give to be saved. I give because I am saved. Y'all with me? That's it. That's it. James 4, James 2, he says, faith without works is dead. Jesus says a tree is known by its fruit. So every tree should produce fruit. If it's an apple tree, you better see some apples on there at some point. Am I right? If you say that you are saved, then fruit should come from your life. So because I'm saved and I believe in Jesus, I give. Because I'm saved and I believe in Jesus, I love. Because I'm saved and I believe in Jesus, I forget. Are y'all picking up what I'm putting yeah. Yeah. We didn't earn our salvation by good works. He gave it to us. And because he gave it to us, we got to act like we got something. That's right. That's right. How can he be stingy with a gift that never mind? Okay. And, and this is it. Paul says, the last thing I need you to know, first thing I need you to know is what? You should celebrate Jesus this season because of who you were. He found you right where you were. He didn't judge you. He just picked you up and cleans you up. He, don't, he doesn't remind you of who you used to be, like we do each other. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't bring up your past sins because love keeps no record of wrong, 1 Corinthians 13. He just loves you right where you are. And the great thing about Jesus is that he's not like people because people will always bring up your past. Ain't that something? You can't be delivered for 20 years before somebody bring up something that you down. That's just what people do. But Jesus never does. Jesus, he never does. And this is the second thing Paul said, I need, you to, I need you to understand that yes, we were all in that mess, but God put his grace on us. Third thing he says, we didn't earn this. This is nothing that we earned. And the fourth thing he says is, in spite of all of it, God sees you as his masterpiece. This is the greatest gift of all to me. That my Savior, the man who came flesh and walked among the world, the man who got on the cross, bled, and died, sees me as a masterpiece. All the stuff that I've done, all the hell that I've raised, all the people that I've hurt, all the stuff that I've stolen. I know we don't talk about thievery in the church, but yes, I used to steal. Yes, I did. Yeah. All the stuff that I've done, and he still looks at me and does not see me as my sin, but sees me as a masterpiece. Story, three instances. There's one, there's one, uh, Beethoven wrote the Ninth Symphony, and it's the most it's the most beautiful, uh, well-known piece of classical music that we know, besides Mozart's, I think, 17. But Beethoven's Symphony, it is known as a classic, and it's very hard to play. Those who play it make millions of dollars because they have that skill to pull it off. But in the ninth stanza, in the ninth group, there is a major flaw in it. And only classical musicians can figure out what the flaw is. Like, if I heard it, I wouldn't recognize the flaw. But classical musicians pick it apart, and they say, no, there's a major flaw there. There's a flaw in it, but it's still his masterpiece. That's right. Take it a step further. Take it a step further. The Mona Lisa. Now, y'all know the picture of that woman. Yeah, you heard. Yeah. The authentic one is priceless. They can even put a price tag on it. But artists, people who study art, said there's two major flaws in it. One, her eyebrows aren't in depth, and two, she has no eyelashes. The painting has two flaws, but it's priceless. Yeah. 
It's a masterpiece. Can I take it a step further? All right. I was watching Pawn Stars. Don't ask me why. Uh, just one that no song. But there was a man who brought a 65 Chevy pickup into the shop. And it was running. The engine was solid, but it was dirty. It was beat up. Paint had rusted over. Uh, the headlights were gone. And he brought it into the shop. And the guy says, I don't know much about Chevy pickups, but I tell you what, I know a guy that does. They go to commercial break, here comes a guy that knows about Chevy pickups. He walks in, y'all know him, yeah, Rick Trail. He comes in and he spends 20 minutes talking about the Chevy pickup. And he comes back and he says, so what's it worth? He says, well, honestly, in this condition, he says, it's probably worth 350000 the man got excited. I can get 350000 for this old beat-up truck that was just sitting in my yard that my granddaddy left to me. He says, okay. He says, well, how about this? You said in this condition, three fifty. dollars He said, what if I repainted it, put new headlights in it, and I did all that? He said, that would drop the value of me. Y'all not getting it? He said, he, said because, he said, because once you take it and try to restore it yourself, he says you're going to drop the value. You'll probably get 50000 for it. What am I saying? That truck with its old beat-up condition, with rusted chip paint and broken headlights and everything else, had value to it because in spite of the fact that it was broken, in spite of the fact that it was rusted, it still was looked at as a masterpiece. I don't know who I'm speaking to in here right now, but you might be beaten up, you might be broken, you might be limping, you might be frustrated, but God said in spite of all the scars on your soul, all the scars on your mind, all the scars on your body, I still see you as a masterpiece. All around this room, it's a bunch of people who are imperfect. All around this room, it's a bunch of people who life has seemed to deal a bad head to. All around this room, it's a bunch of us that have made mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. Bad decision after bad decision. We knew it was going to lead us down the wrong path and we did it anyway. And our faces and our bodies show the results of all those bad decisions. And for some of us, we can't even stand to look at ourselves in the mirror because we don't recognize who we've become because of our bad decisions. But God said, don't you dare try to restore yourself yourself. Leave yourself in the condition that you're in right now. Because as long as you come back to me, I call you masterpiece. So the next time somebody tries to remind you of who you used to be. Yeah, that was me, but I'm a masterpiece now. Yeah, I did, I, I did smoke that, but I'm a masterpiece now. Yes, yes, I did do that, but I'm a masterpiece now. Because the moment that you start to celebrate the way God sees you, and you start to speak that over yourself, you're no longer going to condemn yourself for the stuff that you used to do. Who in this year alone have made mistakes that they never thought they'd make? This year alone, I made mistakes I never, I mean, I said I would never do that, and I found myself doing it. Who in this, who, who of that group has still been unable to forgive themselves for the mistakes they made this year. It's okay, it's all right, it's all right, it's okay, it's all right. I see seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. You're not in bad company, I'm 14. This year alone made mistakes that I said I would never make. Sat back at the beginning of this year and declared that this was my year. God showed me this year would be difficult, but I've been through difficult times before. I said, this is going to be my year. Sat back and judged other people and said, I would never do that. Only to find myself doing the same thing that I said I would never do. The thing about putting your mouth on other people is if you're not careful, you'll end up falling into the same trap that they fell into. Because if you don't know this, try it on the freeway. Your body will take you where your eyes go. And so I spent part of 2019 putting my mouth on the stuff I shouldn't put my mouth on, only to find myself in 2020 making those mistakes. And I promise you, I've had a hard time forgiving myself for the mistakes that I made this year. But I thank God for the reminder that in spite of the mistakes I made, God still sees me as his masterpiece. And so today, I want 
want to pray release on us 14 that raise our hand. Pray release that when we leave here, we're able to look ourselves in the mirror and say, yes, I did it. I shouldn't have done it. But God's grace covered me even when I didn't deserve it. And now I fully embrace it and I know that I'm his masterpiece. Father, we thank you for your darling son Jesus during this holiday season. God, we know that he's the reason for the season. But sometimes we need a reminder as to what he did for us, truly. God, we thank you that he saved our soul from the pit of hell. He saved us from that lifestyle of sin that was leading us to death. God, we thank you for the fact that he covered us when we didn't even know we needed to be covered. That he loved us before we even truly loved him. God, we thank you for the fact that in spite of all of our flaws, he still sees us as a masterpiece. Now, God, he's done his part. We need to do ours. But before this year ends, we want to be able to forgive ourselves for the things that we've done this year alone that we said we'd never do. We've been ashamed and embarrassed by them. Some of us have thought thoughts. Some of us have said words. Some of us have done actions. And we haven't been able to forgive ourselves yet. But I hear the Lord saying, forgiveness is there because I've already provided. You just have to walk in it. And so God, right now, we release it unto you. Because we do not want to end this year with grief and regret. We want to end this year with a praise in our, in our belly. Satan, you no longer have us held hostage by the things that we've done. Because one day we're all going to testify to the fact that God delivered it from us, delivered us from it. And we no longer hold it against ourselves. God, it's our desire to walk closer to you and be all that you called us to be for the remainder of this year. And we thank you for your forgiveness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I, can, I, can I just do something real quick? Where, no, there he is. There he is. No, you, you good? You good? This brother is anointed like you wouldn't believe. He's anointed like you wouldn't believe. Some of us know him well. Others don't know him so, as so much. He's a gifted singer. He's a great musician. He's a great brother. I saw you raise your hand and God just told me to let you know, specifically you, just you. You got to forgive yourself. It's over. It's done. It's over. God said, the, the fact, the proof that I've forgiven you is the fact that you're still here. Yes. You're still here. But God said, I didn't leave you here for you to wallow in unforgiveness. I left you here to impact the world with your gift. But you got to let it go. You got to let it go. Sister April, you got to stop fighting with God. And I just, you got to stop fighting with God. You got to stop fighting with God. The next round, the next round of the fight won't work out in your favor at all. You got to stop fighting with God. You got to stop fighting with God. People ask, what does it look like fighting with God? She's not throwing blows with God. That's not what she's doing. All right, I don't want y'all to get confused. But this is what happens. God speaks to Sister April and gives her a word of her, for her life to impact others in ministry. And she allows her past and the voices of people to pull her back. She is excited and then she falls back real quick. She gets excited and she falls back real quick. She gets excited and she falls back real quick. God says, Sister April, stop fighting with me. Stop fighting with me. Stop fighting with me. The moment you release the fight, you'll see favor fall on your household like never before. The moment you release the fight, favor will just fall on your house. Sister Christina, God knows. The stuff that you are afraid to tell other people because where they may take it, God knows it all. God said he's going to release you to tell the testimony without going into the detail because some people are just nosy. But the moment that you're able to tell the testimony is the moment that the cloud will lift him over your head. He knows, he knows, he knows, he knows. And the thing is, the thing is, the moment you tell the testimony, you'll find out that it's a whole bunch of us that made the same kind of mistake 
They have the same kind of issue. But it's the devil's job to make you think that you're by yourself and you're alone and nobody's ever done it before. The moment that you open your mouth and start to share, you don't have to go into detail because like I said, some people, everybody doesn't need to know. But there's some things, there's, there's a thing, God said, that you're holding on to that's killing you silently. You have to release it. You have to release it. But here's the thing about yours. God said, the moment that you do, you'll free the person next to you. It's not even about you anymore. You will free the person next to you. It'll be free next to you. Listen, I'm done. I just, I just heard God speaking. And I, when God does that, I kind of get a little frustrated. <laughs> because it feels like he's pulling at me, he's antagonizing me. And he won't let it go. But before I leave, Brother Tim, I just have to remind you, God said, I have to remind you. A year and a half ago, you preached a message up here. We had a bench that, and you were one of our speakers. And you brought a message up here. Stood right here, flat footed, and told your testimony and told the gospel. God said, That was not by mistake, that was not by accident, that was by purpose. That was by purpose. So God said, This coming year, you have no choice. You have no choice. Work is not an excuse, family is not an excuse, people are not an excuse. You have no choice. You have no choice. He called you when you were in a place that you didn't want to be. He called you. You know what I'm talking about. He called you when you were in a place that you don't want to be. God said, I need you to remember the promise you made to me when you were in that place when I called you. I need you to remember that. Y'all, Brother Tim is a preacher. Brother Tim, y'all, did y'all hear me? Brother Tim is a preacher. He's not politically correct. He's going to tell you just like it is because he's from Chicago. He's <laughs> He's going to tell you just like it is. He's not going to sugarcoat it. He's going to tell you just like it is. But God said that boldness that you have when you sit amongst the men is the boldness that he's called you to have when you sit amongst everyone. That, that is your assignment. So we're having a church anniversary in March. COVID should be, you know, I don't know. We're going to have a church anniversary. And I want you all to know now, before this year ends, we have three that are coming on to our ministerial staff. Brother Tim. All right. Tommy, right. Minister Vincent, they're all coming on to our ministerial staff this time. I talked to them a little bit, but I need to talk with you. Your mama is waiting on you to walk through that gift. Yeah. I love you. You're ready to go home. But I want us to realize that Jesus is the reason for this season, truly. Amen. Truly. So you may not have the gifts that you desire to have under the tree. But Jesus is there. And with Jesus, there's joy, there's peace, there's love, and there's hope. But most importantly, there is the reminder that he saved your soul from sin. Is there anybody here that's not saved on today? I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to be saved. If you don't know Jesus, we want to make sure that you get to know him on today. Is there one? Is there one? Is there one watching on Facebook Live that needs to get to know Jesus in a real way? We will call you right where you are, and we will lead you in a prayer to get you saved. Is there one? Is there one? Everybody's in here saved. You know Jesus. If he was to come back within the next three minutes, are you sure that you'll be home with him, or will you be on your way to a burning hell? If you're not sure, you need to be saved. So is everybody saved on today? Come on, let's praise God. We're all saved. We're going to prepare our hearts and minds to give right now. I need to see, before we leave, I need to see Minister Vincent.